So I'm, as an American, partly, and as that generation, I didn't want to have anything to do with Stalinism. I didn't right. want, I wanted to say, okay, um, what happened here? What went wrong? How do we make sure that when you go beyond capitalism, you don't go into that dead end or you don't go into that? Uh, in other words, it wasn't just anti Marxists who were critical of what happened in the Soviet Union. It was Marxists, too, who had a problem. Now. How, do you, sure. how do you explain this? How do you make sure that doesn't happen? And when I began to put that together with what I was learning, I became dissatisfied with a good bit of the Marxism that, was, that I was learning. It was too mechanical. It was too simple-minded. It didn't allow for evidence that I thought had to be taken into account, like what happened in the Soviet Union, parts of it, and so on. And so I began, like people do, to look around. Are there any Marxists around who are really good, who have a lot to teach me, but who are not caught in that mechanical way of thinking right. that I don't want to be part of? That That's a part of Marxism I don't want. Is there any other kind around? And that's, you know, it's just the way it is that it happens in life. I discovered that there was one. I began reading and looking, and he had a funny French name, <laughs> Louis, as they pronounce it in France, L-O-U-I-S, Althusser is how they pronounce it, A-L-T-H-U-S-S-E-R. And not only was it intriguing to me, but it turned out that even though I speak French, my father was born in France, so I've spoken French all my life, it was, trans it was being translated into English just as I was getting interested, particularly by a group in England called the New Left Review, a journal mm -hmm. that still exists. That still exists yeah. and they, other did, they did all the in initial translations, and this was the right thing for me. You know, It was like the oasis in the desert. Here was a leading Marxist professor. By the way, he was the, the rector, it's called, of the École Normale, Superior in Paris. That's the highest prestige philosophy school you can be in. It would be the, imagine if we had an, an institution that was an amalgam of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. It, that would be it, the Ecole Normale. And he was not only a professor there, but the the rector of the university. We have this on screen now, the yes. reproduction of capitalism. Yeah, the full PDF is available on libcom.org. And so I couldn't get over it. He was against mechanical Marxism, rejected it. He wanted to bring the contradiction analysis from Hegel into Marxism. He was attuned to this new intellectual ferment around ideas of postmodernism. That's what it was called later. And he thought there was something very important in that that could be brought into Marxism to make it less mechanical and more nuanced. Mm -hmm. and more. It was exactly what I was looking for. So in my first sabbatical at, at UMass, where I was a professor, uh, and speaking French, which of course helped, I, I found a way to get introduced to Althusser in Paris, and I went to Paris, and in the summer of 1979, I worked with him uh, and told him about how interested we were in America. He didn't know that people in America even knew about his work. Uh, the French are quite insular They're often insular, in their right, right. cultural life. You know, in Paris, everybody knows what everybody else is doing, but beyond Paris, they, they barely know. Um, he was a very warm guy, very willing to talk to me, and he really set me on the, a path of reading that kind of Marxism that he was doing, and I found it nothing short of liberational. It allowed me to stay with and explore a Marxism much more subtle, much more nuanced, which led then to a whole network of books that I have written rethinking uh, the Marxian tradition. Indeed, I, I helped together with other people to start a magazine in 1988 called Rethinking Marxism, which is now a global journal, an academic journal, but it's devoted to precisely that, breaking out of the early Marxism of the 20th century, these early efforts to go beyond capitalism, uh, which were mixtures of success and failure, Russia, China, Cuba, Vietnam, 
which shouldn't surprise anybody because the early efforts to go beyond feudalism to capitalism were also mixes of success and failure. It took a long time before you could get the kind of capitalism that could survive. And my guess is we will look back on the early experiments of Russia and China and Cuba and say, well, they learned some things of what to do, and they learned some things of what not to do, and the future will build on what was learned and be more successful Uh, in the way that has happened in the past. And I think in that process, Althusser's rethinking of Marxism um, will be a crucial part of it. David, what, what, uh, what made you interested in Althusser? Well, I started reading Althusser um, primarily in the question of ideology, which I feel like something that you, you know, you're talking about a lot when you're talking about these older Marxists, right? It's like, there's this tension in Marxism, especially in more old, or older Marxism, of this determinism, right? That's Just right. like Marx at the end of the Communist Manifesto, it's like working, you know, people of the world to unite. And the question is like, it was like 100 years later, it's like, where are they? Why has it not happened? And Althusser really starts to try to deal with this question <coughs> of ideology and really introduces this, right. this question that very much ties in a lot of other problematic problematic and that it makes it more difficult to come up with an easy solution um ideas into into marxism primarily what's the role of the state what's the role of education right. you know and right. he talks specifically about you know why does society reproduce itself the same way over and over and over again um and it's in you know reading through althusser you know, you really get a, a better understanding of one, the question of ideology, but also of what Marx and Althusser mean when they talk about scientific concepts. Is this good to put in dialogue with Gramsci? Yes. yes. Okay. It was dialogue. Althusser was heavily affected and influenced by Gramsci, by Lukács, by many of the earlier major thinkers, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, others, and tried to synthesize out of that just as he says, a much more nuanced, the, the old idea that the economy determines what Marxists call the superstructure, Base and superstructure, politics and ideology. No, said Althusser, the ideology has its own effectivity, its own power. The ideology affects and shapes the economic just as the reverse happens. And you have to see this interplay. That's what dialectics means. It, much richer way of thinking through. And so people like me and my colleagues, Stephen Resnick, with whom I wrote a lot of books, we try to take that into economics to show that even though we're economists, economic determinism is a mistake. Right. The economy doesn't shape the rest of society more than it is shaped by them. And the trick of understanding is to see how they interact. That has been a problem with many of the older Marxists who feel as though they're losing something that they want to hold on to because of the economics. For us, Marx's focus on economics is not because it's more important than other things. It's a focus because other people undervalued it. He was going to talk a lot about it to correct the imbalance, but not to counterpose to the dominance of other things, the dominance of economics. He wanted to break that contest and talk about the interaction as how you understand what's going That's on. That's funny, yeah. I, I remember, because when I studied capital in college, I had the concept, Marx in my head was a very linear mechanical thing. Right. And then when you actually, had, I mean, first when you read Capital, it was completely indecipherable. <laughs> but then when you actually got some progress with it, it was like, oh, that's a reference to like Frankenstein. And that, like, this is actually literature and poetry right. and philosophy. And there's great intuitive breakthroughs, like, my wages actually conceal my time being stolen, which I loved. That was my big takeaway. Yes. And then, there, but then there was also just a lot of ambiguity oh, I, and a lot of difficulty and a lot of like, well, this reframes how I look at the world. But okay. And then, and then, what made it amazing was that I could, even in my own, you know, incredibly rudimentary way, look at, well, what about Starbucks or what about you know Apple or whatever? It's like, oh, this still makes sense. The enclosure of the commons, creating right. a market, all of this stuff, it's here. Right. It's alive. And the beauty, you know, I, I've enjoyed just on a very human basis. I'm teaching capital, basically, in the class I teach at the new school right now. Every yeah. Monday, I teach my course there. And uh, I love teaching Marx precisely because, unlike so many economists, 
he really was a European intellectual of his time. The capital is full of quotations from Shakespeare, from Dante, from the ancient Greeks. Marx got his PhD in ancient Greek philosophy. I mean, he, he knew all of the great Greek thinkers the way European educated people did. And, and it's full of humor and irony and sarcasm. I mean, it's, it's, it's much better reading than 99% of what has been forced down my throat as an economics <laughs> Do professor. you think Jordan Peterson misses some oh. of this? <laughs> <laughs> you just enjoyed that Michael Brooks Show video, and you can get a lot more by subscribing to us here at the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. It's literally right there.